Okie dokie. First thing I want to talk to you about in chapter 12 is petitions in Paul's writings. Petitions. Um, several years ago in, in um, New Testament studies, there was a guy named Terrence Mullins. M-U-L-L-I-N-S. And he wrote an article called Petition as a Literary Form in Paul's letters. Petition as a Literary Form. And he was talking about letters, epistles, and how petitions were used in letters. <clears throat> and he broke that down into you know several formal segments of a letter and how that in ancient Greek letters there was this part and this part and this part and this part. And he showed that Paul's letters kind of follow that. Bottom line was, anytime you have a petition verb, which comes out in the King James as, I beseech you, or I urge you in some other places, or I exhort you, it's the Greek word parakalo. Parakalo, this word right here. <clears throat> anytime you see this, anytime you see this verb, in Pauline epistles, <clears throat> you're getting down to some of the serious, what he's trying to say in that letter. Doesn't matter what letter we're talking about. Um, let, me, let me just depart here real quick and give you another example from another letter where this is true. 1 Corinthians, you've got three petitions in 1 Corinthians. You've got one petition, one parakalo at chapter 1, verse 10. You've got another Parakalo at chapter 4, verse 16, I think. And you've got another one at chapter 16, verse 15. There's three petitions. 110, 416, 1650. Now, <clears throat> the first one is that there be no divisions among you and that you all speak the same thing. Okay? And he goes into describing how uh, there were those divisions. And in the first four chapters, he contrasts the wisdom that comes from God which came by revelation to the apostles, with the wisdom that comes from men, which can be anything men want it to be. And as long as you put your faith in the wisdom of men, there's going to be all these disagreements and divisions. But if you get all on the same page with the revealed wisdom of God, there's not going to be any divisions. So you get to chapter 4, verse 16, and he says, I beseech you, second time, be ye imitators of me, which means I'm an apostle. I got the wisdom directly from God. If you'll all just do what I say, there won't be any what? No divisions. So everything he says from chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8 about all these problems that the Corinthians had, the only reason now that all the Corinthians are going to listen to Paul is because chapters 1 through 4 said there's divisions, and it's because you're following the wisdom of men instead of the wisdom of God, and I'm an apostle, and I've got the wisdom of God, and so you need to do what I say because it comes from God. Now, point one, I say this about the guy living with his father's wife. Point two, I say this about these lawsuits. Point three, I say this about fornication and marriage. Point four, I'm telling you this about food offered to idols. Why listen to Paul? Because you've got the wisdom from God. So there won't be divisions. Then, at chapter 16, verse 15, he says, I beseech you again. I want you to follow the example of Stephanus and people like that who just set themselves to doing the work of the Lord and don't cause any trouble. But if you follow leaders like Stephanus, who just humbly work for the Lord and don't cause any trouble, there won't be any what? There won't be any divisions. So the petitions are all connected throughout the book. See? And those are those are key to the general message of the book of First Corinthians. Yes, sir. Uh, then is it just the... Uh the first person singular form of that verb in which it's it can be first person plural we beseech you okay. it can be I beseech you but this verb wherever you see it is, so, is a key verb okay and it can be other verbs there are other petition verbs like uh, herotao I ask you um, I beg you there are several of these but parakalo is the one that Paul tends to use most this one right here so in Romans we've got yeah go ahead Joey. so you said when, when you told us that, you said, when you see this, you have Paul, and I didn't get the Okay, list. when you see one of these verbs, you know that this particular passage is where somehow he's getting down to what he really wants to ask these people. Then you haven't had one of these up till chapter 12. What he's been doing is laying the theological or doctrinal foundation 
to now ask him what he really wants to ask him. See? So you have the first one in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He, he, he actually asks them to do uh, two things, or three things. Uh, the beseech you is to present, present, to not be conformed, and to be transformed. So that's what he's asking them to do. Three things. I'm asking you to present. I'm asking you not to be conformed. I'm asking you to be transformed. We're going to come out, come back and flesh this one out as we just deal with chapter 12. But turn to chapter 15. <coughs> chapter 15 and verse 30. Chapter 15 and verse 30. This is our second petition. In the book of Romans. <clears throat> I beseech you, brothers, your Lord Jesus Christ, I love the Spirit, that you agonize with me in uh, your prayers for me to God, that I might be delivered from the disobedient in Judea, and that my ministry for the saints in Jerusalem might be acceptable to the saints. See, the real importance of this petition is. Throughout the book of Romans, he's been talking about Jews and Gentiles and how this group was boasting over that group and that group was boasting over this group and there was tension between the two even though they were all sinners, even though they all needed the gospel, even though none of them could be saved by works, even though they all needed the righteousness of God. Now what's happening in chapter 15 is there is an overt act of unity between the Gentile churches and the Jewish churches. The Gentile churches have gotten together a contribution. The word contribution is kononoi, which means a fellowship. The Gentile churches are reaching out to the Jewish churches in Jerusalem and saying, we want to help you. And if you really consider us your brothers and sisters in Christ, you will accept the gift that we are sending you. So Paul is hoping for this overt act of fellowship between the two to be accepted so that the unity he's pushing for in the book of Romans ends up having real flesh on it in the real world in this action. Okay, So the petition in chapter 12 is, con is, is uh, <coughs> connected to this petition. Then the third petition is in 16.17. See, and that's when they're all swelled up and he says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Now give each other some love. And then he says, now I'm beseeching you to mark those that would cause any of this division among you. Contrary to the doctrine of you. <coughs> Namely, contrary to this doctrine of justification by faith, which you've learned in the first chapters, it says you're all equally sinners, and you're all equally saved by grace, and you're all the same in Christ. Now mark anybody that tries to cause trouble that goes against that doctrine that you're all one in Christ Jesus. See how that one goes along with the one in chapter 15, which goes along with the one in chapter 12? Well, that, that probably doesn't be a case against uh, some of the critics saying this belongs to Ephesians too. I mean, maybe I don't... I'll no, you're following exactly. Because if you really understand the flow of thought of Romans, it fits perfectly as the capstone of the whole book of Romans. Because the doctrinal basis leads right to where he's going. Paul did not write the book of Romans to, to give some theological epistle. He wrote the book of Romans to unify the Jewish and Gentile groups of Christians in Rome. And they had to have the doctrinal foundation to get together. That's why I wrote the book of Romans. And the petitions show that that's the truth. I'm asking you this, I'm asking you this, and I'm asking you this. <coughs> so remember, anytime you're studying a Pauline epistle, and you're thinking to yourself, well, am I getting what this letter is really about? Look at the petitions and ask yourself, what do these have to do with each other and what do these have to do with the development of the thought in this book? And you'll be getting real close to what the book's really supposed to be all about. I beseech you. Okay? <clears> T.Y. <throat> Mullins, petition as a literary form, New Testament studies. I can't remember the thing, but if you type it in the computer... It'll come up for you. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he says,
says in 12.1, I beseech you, brothers. Now see, in 2.17, he says, I'm talking to you Jews. In 11.13, he says, now I'm talking to you Gentiles. And then in 12.1, he says, now I beseech you, brothers. Now who's he talking to? Both. See? And they're brothers. And I don't think he's saying that by accident. See, I beseech you, brothers. <clears throat> Based on the mercies of God. See, the mercies of God is all about that stuff in chapters 1 through 11 about how that we can't save ourselves and God has given us his righteousness in Christ and by his grace all of us are saved. So based on the mercies of God, you, Brother Ben Ezra, and you, Brother um, Theophilus, both of you guys have had to be saved by the mercies of God, right? So I'm asking you, says Paul, based on the mercies of God that you're all beholden to, to be where you are in, in the tree, in Christ, I beseech you, <clears throat> number one, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, this word present ought to ring a bell or two for you. Because if you go back to 6, 12, and 13, <clears throat> after he said you died in sin and were raised with Christ, he said, now don't present your members as instruments of righteousness, unrighteousness and sin, but present yourselves to God as alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness and to God. You, you've been saved by God's grace. Now give yourself to the service of God. Um, Romans 6.16 Don't you know that to whomever you present yourselves as servants unto obedience, his servants you are, whom you obey. So I used to be a Jew. I used to be a Gentile. But what am I now? I'm a slave of Christ. Doesn't matter if I'm named Ben Ezra or Theophilus. I'm still a servant of Christ. So present yourselves. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. <clears throat> now, the word um, sacrifice is a noun. And there are three adjectives in this verse that modify the word sacrifice. It is a living sacrifice. That is an adjective modifying sacrifice. It is a holy sacrifice. That is an adjective modifying sacrifice. And it is a pleasing sacrifice. See, living, holy, and pleasing are all adjectives that modify the noun sacrifice. <clears throat> so you could translate this. I beseech you, brethren, to present your bodies to God as a living, holy, pleasing sacrifice. So that would follow the grammar real nicely. And then he explains what that means, which is your spiritual service. Now, the word spiritual, or, or um, however yours translates it there, <coughs> L-O-G-I-K-A-N, logikain, <coughs> which you could translate the service of your mind. So basically, it's going back to 725 where Paul says, So I with my mind am serving the Lord, the law of God. Or back to the mind of the spirit versus the mind of the flesh. In other words, when your head is there, when you've died to sin, when you've really given yourself to God, I want you to give yourself in your minds to God as servants of God. Quit thinking about being Jews or Gentiles and all your customs. I am now a servant of God. You know. Be that way in your thinking about yourself. Consider yourself. This is very related to 611. Think of yourselves as dead to sin and alive to God. See? So present your bodies by presenting your mind. Your actions follow your thinking, right? So present your bodies <clears throat> as a living, holy, pleasing sacrifice, which is the service of your mind. Except and in the process, he said, do not be conformed to this world. And here's what I think he means by that. In context. How did worldly Jews and Gentiles who didn't know about the redemptive plan of God in Christ, how did they treat each other? Couldn't stand each other, didn't touch each other, didn't have nothing to do with each other. So he's just taught them how they're all the same and they're all redeemed in Christ. Now he says, now I don't want you to be conformed to this world. 
I don't want you Jews and Gentiles treating each other like Jews and Gentiles treat each other in this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, this doctrine from Romans 1 through 11 is supposed to have changed their mind about how they think of each other. They're supposed to have a new perspective. We're all sinners. We're all lost. We're all indebted to the righteousness of God. We're all redeemed by Jesus Christ. We've all presented ourselves as slaves to Jesus. Who am I? I am a slave of Christ. You are a slave of Christ. I am a brother in Christ. You are a brother in Christ. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may approve what the will of God is. In other words, as a Christian, not as a Jew, not as a Gentile, but as a Christian, what does God want me to do? He wants me to give old Theophilus some love is what he wants to do. <clears throat> See? He does not want Peter to eat with Theophilus, Theophilus until James and the big boys from Jerusalem come down and then refuse to eat with them just because they're afraid the Brotherhood Club of Jews will throw them out of the club because they're supposed to all be one in Christ Jesus. I think that's really what's being said here in context. And he says, so that you might approve what is the will of God, namely that which is good and acceptable and perfect. See, that's what God wants us to do. So he's asking them to give themselves to God and change the way they think. Based on what? Based on the mercies of God, which is chapters 1 through 11. All this stuff about you're all sinners, you're all saved by grace, you're all recipients of the gift of God's righteousness, you're all in the body of Christ, therefore... Don't be like the world is toward each other. Be transformed in the renewing of your minds. Do what God wants you to do. Now, see how this follows in context. Verse 3. For I say through the grace that was given to me, meaning the gift of my apostleship, to everyone that is among you. Now, if you've been reading the first part of Romans, what does that mean? Jew and Gentile. Jew and Gentile. <laughs> Not to think of himself more highly. That's a synonym for what? Boasting. Boasting. See if you connect not to think of themselves more highly here with back to 11.25 where he says, do not be wise in your own estimation. Connect that back to 11.20 where he says, do not think highly of yourselves but fear. Connect that back to 11.18 where he says, do not boast yourself over the other branches. And connect that back to all those boasting passages about the Jews. Am I making this up or is there a real connection there? Mm -hmm. And then he says, I'm telling every one of you, you and Gentiles, do not think more highly. In other words, don't boast, don't brag, don't act like you're better than Ben Ezra or you're better than Theophilus. You know, you guys are not better than each other. Don't act like that anymore, he says. But to think soberly. As God has appointed to each one a measure of faith. Now, F.F. F. Bruce <clears throat> has the best comment on this, um, as far as I'm concerned. And it, it's for several reasons. He translates this as, as God has appointed to each one a measure of responsibility. This word measure and metron, which is used here in this verse, has to do with spiritual gifts in the theology of Paul. Uh, he uses it in other passages like Ephesians 4, 7. To each one of us was this grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Ephesians 4, verse 7. He uses it in other Pauline uh, passages dealing with spiritual gifts. Bruce says that what's happening in this verse is Paul is saying that as Christians, not as Jews or Gentiles, but as Christians, by giving the Christians various spiritual gifts, God had entrusted them with a measure of responsibility in the body of Christ. He says that no longer were they to think of themselves as Jews or Gentiles, but as members of the body of Christ, who had been given some kind of responsibility to further the work and mission of the body of Christ. And I think the verses that come after... Um, kind of justify that position. And, and so I would translate, instead of the word faith, I would translate that a measure of something that has been entrusted to you. Something entrusted, namely a spiritual gift of some kind. So the faith is nothing to do with 
What's that? The tape is not in the text? It is. The word pistis is in the text. The question is, what does he mean by it? And I don't think he means that God gives us faith. Because if you read the whole previous part of the book of Romans, faith is what they have to do, trusting God to give them something that they can't do for themselves. But God has apportioned or measured out something to us, and that is what he has entrusted to us. That is the trust that God has put in us by giving us that gift. I think that's what he's talking about. But don't accept it. Just write it down and study it some more. All right, verse 4. For just as in one body we have many members. Now see, now you're not a Jew, you're not a Gentile, you're a member of the body of Christ. And all the members do not have the same function. See, we're talking about the different functions of different members of the body of Christ. So also we who are many are one body in Christ. It doesn't matter if I'm, if I'm a finger or if I'm an ear. I'm still part of the body of Christ, the unified body of Christ. And my job as a finger or an ear is to do what I need to do for the good and the progress of the body of Christ. See? I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Gentile. I am a member of the body of Christ. That's who I am. That's my identity. And as that, I need to fulfill my function, namely employ my gifts, whatever those gifts are, for the good of the body. Yes, sir. Uh, Dan, I don't recall you commenting on this word when we were going through it, but the, the word translated in NASB, worship, um, Latreon. Latreon. Uh-huh. Um, and I, priestly service. Right. Does that tie into what he's talking about here and the way that they're using the gifts in a, uh, I just don't, I'm trying to figure, you, met, you mentioned spiritual mindset, but how does that work, work into priestly okay. worship? And you see context? that word Latreon there, our spiritual service or right. our spiritual, I don't, I wouldn't translate it worship, I'd call it service, like we're priests that are serving God. But let me show you some other places. Look back at chapter 1, verse 9. Okay. <coughs> Chapter 1, verse 9, you have the same word in verb form. He says, God whom I latruo, I serve with my spirit. Okay. See, serving with my spirit is sort of like serving with my mind. Mm-hmm. Then go to 725. Okay. 725. And let's see here. He says, so then I with my mind serve the law of God. Well, that's do lo-o. That's a different word, but... It's still the idea of the mind there. Serve with my spirit, serve with my mind. Gotcha. Okay. First, first reference one nine. And then the second one was one again. Seven twenty five. All right. So. So there is two words: la, la true and. Uh, do lo And logikain. Yeah, logikain means of your mind. Okay. Some translate it spiritual, but it means of your mind. <clears throat> your spiritual service, the service of your mind. I want your, I want your attitude to be given to God along with your body. You, you really can't just give your body. That's impossible. Your body goes where your what has gone before, or your mind has gone before. See? So you got to give him your mind to give him your body. That's the idea. All right. Now look at verse five. So also we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. So Mr. Ben Ezra over there with his big long nose and his fringe is a is a member of the same body as Mr. Theophocles over here with his short little nose and his skinny bald head and his toga. You know, both those guys are brothers together. These these people weren't living in Texas. They were down there in, in Rome and there was a real they looked different. They smelled different because some of them ate bacon and some of them didn't. <laughs> uh, some of them ate matzo balls and some of them ate pork. You know, they were way different from each other. So the differences were, were culturally big, but, but Paul's trying to say you're the same. You're members of the body of Christ. Now then verse 6. Watch this. Having gifts differing according to the grace that was given to us. See, each member of the body, each Christian, has gifts differing according to the grace which was given to us. Notice the grace which was given to us in verse 6 compared with the grace that was given to me in verse 3. Same phrase. 
Verse 3, Paul is talking about the gift of his apostleship. Verse 6, he's talking about the various spiritual gifts given to other people. Now, um, this word is charismata. Charisma. He's talking about spiritual gifts. Now, this is going to be another one of those uncomfortable discussions for you. Because churches of Christ historically don't like to talk about this. We've just let, let the Pentecostals have this. I think we've made a big fat error here. And I'm going to tell you why. And then you can go home and, and uh, think about it some more. <clears throat> I, want to, I want to email you all a paper. You can read it later. It's called Toward the Theology of the Holy Spirit. And let me explain the methodology behind the paper. What I've done in this paper is I've tried to look at each distinct writer of the New Testament. Luke, for example, in Luke Acts. What does Luke have to say about the Holy Spirit in context of Luke Acts? Bingo. Then I've tried to look at John in the New Testament. John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. What does John have to say about the Holy Spirit? Only in the context of John. Then I have looked at Paul and I have said, Okay, what does Paul, just letting Paul be Paul, what does Paul say about the Holy Spirit? What does Peter say about the Holy Spirit? Only after looking at each one in its context by itself and deducing what they have to say about the Holy Spirit have I even dared to try to put anything together toward a doctrine or a theology of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense to you? Because until you understand Romans by itself, you ain't got any reason to be putting it together with Acts 8 or something else until you understand what Romans is saying by itself. First, you need to understand what Luke is saying. Okay? So that's what I've done. Now, what I have concluded is that we've tried to mash a bunch of stuff together that doesn't go together. And in doing that, we've misunderstood a bunch of things. So what I would like to do with you, since this is a class in Romans, I want to look real briefly at Paul's theology of spiritual gifts. Paul, who wrote the book of Romans. There are three passages, real quick, I'd like to go over. These are Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4. These are three passages in Paul about charismata about spiritual gifts. And let's keep them in context and see what Paul is saying about them in these passages. <clears throat> okay. So in this passage, in Romans 12, um, Paul is saying that, okay, Jew or Gentile, we're all members of the body of Christ, and the various members of the body of Christ have been given various gifts according to the grace that was given to us. And then he lists some. He says, if it's prophecy, let him prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. Now, again, I would translate faith as that which has been entrusted to him. Namely, if the gift of prophecy has been entrusted to you, if God has thought enough of you to give you the gift of prophecy, then you need to use that gift for the good of the body of Christ in a responsible way. See, that's what I think he's saying. If indeed, he says, it's the gift of ministry, then let him give himself to his ministry. If it's the gift of teaching, he that teaches, let him give himself to his teaching. We're not all prophets, we're not all ministers, we're not all teachers. But whatever gift God has given you, use that to the utmost for the good of the body of Christ, because that's who you are, you're a member of the body of Christ. If it's encouragement, let him give himself to his encouragement. If it's giving, let him do it with sincerity. If it's managing or ruling, let him do that with diligence. If it's showing mercy, let him do that with sincerity. <clears throat> so you have all of these gifts listed here. Prophecy, ministry, teaching, encouraging, giving, managing, mercy. Okay? And what Paul seems to be saying to these people is, you think of yourselves as being Christians now, as members of the body of Christ. Whatever your gift is... Use that gift in the ministry of the Lord's church for the good of the Lord's church and for the good of the ministry of Christ. Simply. That's it. Bingo. End of story. Now, 
They sat here. <clears throat> Paul had never been to Rome, right? True or false? True. True. It says so in the book. Well, how did the church at Rome get started? Well, the church at Rome maybe got started from Jews that were at Pentecost from Rome, and then they went back home to Rome, and you can speculate maybe that they um, brought spiritual gifts with them. Um, but see, we've, we've got something in our minds here that I want to challenge. And I know it's going to be holy, 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 holy. But I'm still going to challenge it a little bit just to get you to think about it. I'm not sure that the New Testament teaches that all spiritual gifts were only given by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Because I think we've gotten that by mashing some passages together that don't go together. And I'll show you that here in just a little bit. But these people had never seen Paul, but yet they did have spiritual gifts. They well, they could have seen another apostle. That's true. However, you have to note here in chapter uh, 12, <coughs> 6 through 8, that this list of gifts includes what we might call, this is our categorization, now not biblical categorization. We would call some of these gifts miraculous. So what we would do is take Paul's list and we'd split it up. And we'd put most of them over here in this category that says non-miraculous. And we'd put that gift of prophecy, if we're studying our Bible very well, over in the category of the miraculous. Okay, miraculous, non-miraculous. Unfortunately, Paul didn't do that. He just gave us all those in one big lump. But we say, no, Paul, uh-uh. You've got to put the miraculous over here, the non-miraculous over there. He didn't, but we do. All right, now let me show you passage number two, and we'll get back and compare it to passage number one. Go to Roman, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12 and following is one of the most neglected passages of churches of Christ. The reason we don't like that passage is because we think it's been delegated to the past and that passage belongs to the apostles. But actually, Paul wrote it as part of the first Corinthians. Okay? So he says, concerning spiritual gifts, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, <clears throat> he gets down to talking about these spiritual gifts and uses the same word as in Romans 12, 6, in verse 4. He said there are diversities of gifts. I want you to underline the word diversities and the word gifts. <clears throat> there are differences or diversities of gifts. That's charismata. That's the same word as you have in Romans 12, 6, charismata. So there are differences of gifts, but the same spirit. Notice, different, same, different, same. It's the same Holy Spirit, but it's manifesting itself in different gifts. That guy has the prophecy, that guy has the gift of healing, you know. Same spirit, different gift. Look at verse 5. There are different differences of ministries, underline the word ministries, but the same Lord. Now, I think ministries is another way of saying gifts. See? Then in verse 6, there are differences of workings, underline workings, but the same God. Notice in verse 4, you've got Spirit, Lord, God. If you progress down from verse 4, 5, 6, Spirit, Lord, God. You've got different, same, different, same, different, same. Different gifts, ministries, workings. But the same Spirit, Lord, God. Okay? So what are these things? Well, they're called gifts. Why are they gifts? Because they came from God. What else are they called? They're called ministries. Why are they called ministries? Because you use your gift in the ministries of the church. What else are they? They're called workings. Why? Because it's not just us doing it. It's God doing it through us. Okay? So you could call them gifts. You could call them ministries. You could call them work workings. But now look at verse 7. To each one, the manifestation of the Spirit has been given for the common good. Underline the manifestation of the Spirit. What does he mean, the manifestation of the Spirit? He means the particular gift, the particular ministry, the particular working, the particular manifestation of the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit manifests himself in Merrick's life in one way, 
And in Brandon's life, maybe in another way, because maybe he's given him the gift of teaching, maybe he's given him another gift, but it's still the same spirit working in both of those guys, though they may not do the same job or function in the church. Remember Romans chapter uh, 12 where he said, now we were all members of the same body, but not all the members have the same function. You got your finger, you got your toe, you got your ear, you got your eyeball. Eyeball's got the gift of seeing. Ear's got the gift of hearing. Thumb's got the gift of gripping. See what I'm saying? Different gifts, all given by God. Same body, same church. Okay, now look down here. He lists nine spiritual gifts here after this. Uh, Look at verse 8 and following. You've got the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. Uh, You've got all of those different gifts, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirit, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Verse 11 is the point. In all of these worketh the one and the same spirit, distributing to each one as he wills. So who decided what gifts a person received? Was it the person or God? God, the spirit. And he spread out different gifts in the body so that you'd have different functions of the body covered. You don't just want one big digestive system. You want a nervous system to go with it. And you want a circulatory system to go with it. And you don't just want one big foot. You need a hand to grab a hold of stuff. And you don't just want a big eyeball or to be deaf. You want an ear to go along with it. See, So God put all these things in there. Now let's just keep reading in 1 Corinthians 12. For just as there is one body and it has many members, that kind of sounds like Romans 12, 4, and 5 to me. Just as there is one body and it has many members, and all the members of the body being many are still one body, so also is Christ. See, we are different members, but we're still one body. Now watch verse 13. This is the kicker. For in one spirit we were all baptized into the one body, whether Jew or Greek. Man, that sounds a lot like Romans. If by one spirit we were all baptized into the one body, whether Jew or Greek, he says, whether slave or free, and we were all made to drink from the one spirit. This tells me that in Paul's theology, by virtue of our baptism into Christ, we have all been admitted to drink from the reservoir of the Holy Spirit. It's the only people who are baptized in Christ have to be have or have the right to become partakers to drink from the Holy Spirit. Now, when we drink from the Holy Spirit, when we are partakers of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit manifests Himself in each one of us in different ways or different functions in the body of Christ. He, he just goes right there in verse 14. For just as there is one body, uh, we're many members, and if the foot should say Uh, To the hand, because I'm not the hand, I'm not a member of the body, then it is not therefore not of the body, is it? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a member of the body? So this ear and eye business, this foot and hand business, is contextually directly connected to spiritual gift business. Uh, Yes or no? Yes, it is. So foot, hand, ear, eye is about which gift you've got. How'd you get the gift? You got baptized into the body of Christ and you were admitted to drink from... The Holy Spirit. But Paul, you hadn't mentioned anywhere in here the laying on of apostles' hands. I think that's because what Paul is thinking of here doesn't have anything to do with the laying on of the apostles' hands. That's something different. Now, not that there were not some special things given by the laying on of the apostles' hands. I'm going to get to that later. When you get down to verse 27 here, after he described the body and how we're all members of the body, Jew or Gentile, he says... You are the body of Christ and members, each one of it. And then he says, God has placed in the church. See, just like verse 11 says, the Spirit gives the gift. God has placed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, thirdly teachers, fourthly workers of miracles, then gifts of healing, then helps, then governments, then different kinds of tongues. Now look at that list. Apostles. Would we say miraculous or non-miraculous? Miraculous, right? 
Signs and wonders, apostles was a big deal. How about um, uh, prophets getting direct revelation from God? Miraculous or not? Miraculous. How about teachers? See, we'd put that in the non, wouldn't we? Okay. How about workers of miracles? Well, I'd put that in the mirror, aculus. And then how about gifts of healing? Well, I'd call that miraculous. How about helps? Oh, maybe not. No. How about governments? Well, that reminds me of the one over in Romans that said managing. How about um, tongues? Well, I'd put that in the miraculous. Now, wait a minute here, Paul. You're killing me. Because in both Corinthians... By the way, the ones that say, brethren, I want to tell you that there are nine spiritual gifts. And they list off the ones in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. They should have kept reading to the end of the chapter. Because he lists a whole bunch more besides those nine. See? And they should have kept reading in Romans 12 because he lists a whole much, whole much more besides them. And if you list them all out on the board, you're going to come out with a whole bunch more than nine. See? And your problem is, <clears throat> Paul, you're not helping us here, Paul. Paul, you seem to have the miraculous and the non-miraculous gifts in the same list, and you don't seem to be making any distinction between them at all. What's your problem, Paul? Here's my question. Does the problem rest with Paul, or does the problem rest with us and our preconceived notions? Now, let me ask you this. If it's a gift... And it really comes from God. And God is really doing it through you. Then when you use a label like miraculous, is that God splitting hairs or us splitting hairs? Hmm. See, we don't like the word gift. We like to substitute a different word. What word do we like better than gift? Talent. Now, it's not that God said talent in his word. He said gift. But we like talent because... If it's a talent, then it doesn't have to be what? Right. Ah, there you go. So let's rewrite the Bible, and let's put the word talent in here instead of gift. But then you'd have to have the talent of healing and the talent of tongues. Well, we don't like that. So we're just so inconsistent that we're just all over ourselves inconsistent. And no wonder that the Pentecostals don't have any respect for us. Because we're just completely inconsistent in all this, if we're really honest with ourselves and we're not in a brotherhood club. Well, are, they <coughs> are they consistent? No. But at least we ought to have enough honor to be consistent. Okay? So that's what I'm trying to work toward is consistency and honesty. All right? So there's a lot of spiritual gifts. Now, when you get down here to chapter 13, he starts into, if you use these gifts... You need to use them in love. You don't need to use them in a selfish way for your own aggrandizement. You need to use them for the good of the body of Christ. These Corinthians that were standing up in church and interrupting church to speak in tongues, they weren't using that gift for the good of the body. They were being selfish and divisive in the use of the gift. <clears throat> so in chapter 13, he says, whatever gift you have, it doesn't matter. Use it in love for the good of the church. Don't use it for something that's not for the good of the church. But now let's go down to verse 8. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. He's emphasizing the principle of love as the way to use the gift. Think of this. <clears throat> this finger is not going to do anything that he doesn't think is for the good of the rest of this body. Right? He's going to love this body and do whatever's good for this body. This eye is not going to do anything that's not for the good of the rest of this body. This foot is not going to carry me anywhere that he thinks is going to hurt the rest of this body. Because the, the, the members of the body are all in love. They work in love for the good of each other, don't they? Yes, they do. If this thing just starts flopping around here, banging on walls and everything, and it's just going off on its own, <clears throat> then something bad wrong here, right? We're going to take me to the neurologist and figure out what's going on. Okay? So in 13.8, love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, now correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't prophecies one of these gifts that's in the list earlier on in 1 Corinthians 12? It is, isn't it? Whether there be prophecies, they shall cease. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, 
it shall be done away. He lists three spiritual gifts. Prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. Now, every one of those gifts was a what I call a revelatory gift. Again, that's not my that's not a Bible word. But every one of those gifts was a way that God revealed his word in some form or fashion. He lists prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. <clears throat> They're going to cease. He says, for we know in part. <clears throat> see, our this, this gift of knowledge gives partial knowledge. He didn't dump the whole Bible on one of these guys that had this gift. He gave him a little revelation that he could share with the church. We prophesy in part. He didn't give the whole Bible to somebody that was a prophet. He gave him a little message for that day. Uh, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the complete comes... See, you've got two words here. Meros. This is the two comparison words. Meros, which means a portion or a part. And you've got teleos or teleon, which means complete. If you have a pie up here, and you break that pie up into pieces. Each one of those pieces is meros, part. The whole pie, that's teleos. Perfect, complete. So what he's saying here to me is that when the complete revelation comes, these partial means of revelation will be done away with. Okay? But now here's the leap we've taken. And I want you to think about this. See, what Paul actually says here, is that I want you to exercise all your gifts in love, and I want you to know that there are some of your gifts that are just temporary in their purpose. When God gets done revealing his will, we won't need tongues or knowledge or prophecy. And one of those gifts will be done away. Okay, Paul, fine. Do we then conclude from that, taking this big leap, therefore all spiritual gifts have been done away? I don't see any possible justification for that in the context. Because the whole big discussion has been the body of Christ, we're baptized into the body of Christ. We all get drink from the Spirit. The Spirit manifests itself in different ways. We all work for the common good. Now we're going to just erase all that? No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that the revelatory gifts who have served their purpose are going to be done away with. Okay? So what does 1 Corinthians 13 actually say. It says that tongues, knowledge, and prophecy are going to be done away with. When are they going to be done away with? Well, when the complete revelation comes. But then he says, even after these gifts are done away with, still remains faith, hope, and love. Well, how long does faith remain? Until it becomes sight, until Jesus comes again, and there won't be any more faith. How long does hope remain? Hope that is seen is not hope. So when Jesus comes, there won't be any more hope. So, even after tongues, knowledge, and prophecy are done away with, there's still more time before Jesus comes. But when Jesus comes, the only thing that will remain is love. Okay? Now, then he goes on in chapter 14 and says, Now, I want you to use your spiritual gifts this way. So, Paul, what have you said? If we forget all of our predispositions, what have you said? I've said that every Christian who's baptized into the body of Christ gets to partake of the Holy Spirit. And that God gives gifts to those different Christians. And they're supposed to use them for good in the body of Christ. And they're supposed to use them in love. But there's some of those gifts that have a special purpose that are going to be done away with. Okay, Paul. Now let's go to Ephesians 4. Other chapter. Should we save our questions? To... Yeah, then we'll have a great big question. <laughs> <laughs> but first I want you to see these three passages. And the similarity of the of the theology in the three passages, Ephesians 4. Now, remember that Romans 12 is a unity passage, right? 1 Corinthians 12 is a unity passage. And Ephesians 4 is a unity passage. Because he starts out in Ephesians 4... Uh, telling them to live in a way that's worthy of their calling. And what is that, Paul? With all humility and gentleness, with long-suffering, putting up with each other in love, endeavoring to keep this unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You're supposed to all be together. Let me give you your doctrinal basis of unity. There's one body, one Spirit, 
one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. So you ought to all be together in all those things. But within that unity of one group, look at verse 7. But to each one of us was this grace given. Wow, that sounds like Romans 12, 6. For he says, now we have gifts differing according to the grace that was given to us. Or am I making this up? It sounds a lot like it to me. Okay? To each one of us was this grace given. Now, does that say to certain few of us? What does it say? It says to each one of us was this grace given. Does it say only to the people that got hands laid on them? No, it says to each one of us was this grace given. According to the measure, which is the same word he uses in Romans 12, 4 and 5, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And the gift of Christ is the gift that Christ gives us. And he proves that in the next verse. Wherefore he says, when he ascended on high, who ascended on high? Jesus. He led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. So Paul says, by virtue of the death and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus has given gifts to his church. All right? So you go down here to verse 9. Who is he that ascended, except he that also descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he that descended, is he not the one that ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things? And he gave, underline he gave in verse 11. Go back to verse 7 where it says he gave gifts to men okay so connect that to verse 11 and he gave what apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers now does that look anything like the Corinthian list it do don't it but Paul you've done it to me again you said apostles and prophets and those were miracles. But then you went ahead and blew my mind because you put evangelists, pastors, and teachers in the same list as you put apostles and prophets. Paul, why didn't you make a column there and put the miraculous on one side like I wanted you to and put all the non-miraculous on the other side like I wanted you to? I'm pretty sure if Paul was here, he'd say this. He'd say, because God's doing all of them, and what's your problem? There's not any difference. God can do anything, and just like he gives you the gift of teaching, he can give that guy the gift of healing, and to God, there's not any difference in it. It's all God. Just because you consider that miraculous, and you don't consider that one miraculous, that's not God's problem, that's your problem. So quit putting God in your little box, Paul would say, because it's all God doing. It's God giving his people gifts. Jesus gave gifts to men. Now, if Jesus gave the gift, and it's a gift, and it's more than just a talent, because it has to do with his death and resurrection and what he only gives to people in the body of Christ. The Bible uses the word gift. Okay, so look at why he gave them. Verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. Remember in 1 Corinthians 12, 4? He called them gifts, and he also called them what in verse 5? Ministries. What's the purpose of the gifts? To be used in the ministries of the church. Why did God give the church gifts? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Well, is that a temporary function? Or is that a permanent function? Well, some people that try to make it temporary will go to verse 13 until... But that mekri is not a word which means it's going to be to a point of time. It means to the goal of uh, all of us attaining the unity of the faith. See, being one in the body of Christ and all doing our functions under the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that you might no longer be babes driven and tossed about by every wind of teaching. But speaking in the truth in love, verse 15, that you might grow up into all things and the head is the head, even Christ. Now look at verse 16, which is really important. From whom, that is, from Christ, all the body, 
Now, it's interesting to me that in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4, in all three passages, Paul uses the body illustration. All three passages. And in all three passages, the functions of the body are related to the different spiritual gifts. But in 4.16, he says, from whom all the body, fitly framed and knit together through that which every joint supplies. Watch this. According to the working in due measure. Look at that word working. in Energeion. Remember 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4, 5, and 6? He called them gifts and ministries. And what else? Working. Working. And he also said, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Same word right here, measure. So according to the working in due measure of each individual part causes the growth of the body and to the building up of itself in love. Why did God, Paul's theology, forget the rest of the New Testament right now. Why did God give spiritual gifts to the body of Christ? So that the work of ministry could be carried out, so that the building of the body of Christ should be carried out. Now, was the function of some of those gifts temporary? Yes. And Paul said tongues, knowledge, and prophecy would be done away. But I think if you read all of Paul's letters, you would be very, very hard-pressed to be consistent with this and say, just because he said tongues, knowledge, and prophecy were going to be done away, therefore all spiritual gifts are done away. No. No way, Jose. No way you could justify that any way, shape, or form if you were honest with the writing of Paul. So, what we have to do is take us a five-minute water break, and then we're going to come back and we're going to see how Acts 8 fits into this, if it does at all. And we're going to see what was that business about laying on the apostles' hands. And we're going to talk about what should we really think about spiritual gifts. Uh, to, to ease your mind, do I think we can heal people? No. Do I think we can speak in tongues? No. But I also want to be honest with what the Bible says about spiritual gifts. So let's take a five-minute break, come back, we'll cover Acts 8, then we'll cover all questions you might have, and we'll go from there. Thank you. 